Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be talking about the first movement of Bach's Sonata No. 3 in C major, the Adagio. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some of the issues that pertain to all of the sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So, this movement is really an incredible creation. It's totally different than the aesthetic of the first movements of the other two sonatas, which are you know, all of these elaborate ornaments. This one almost in essence is an extended introduction to the second movement, the massive fugue, because it's really not as good as a standalone. I don't see a lot of people playing just this adagio as an encore or a little interlude in a recital or something like that, but that doesn't mean that it's not great. It's just not really meant to stand on its own two feet. It almost feels like you know, this gradual unfolding, something almost primordial that starts on middle C and just opens out into finally this miraculous fugue. So when thinking about how to approach this movement, you really have two choices when it comes to bowing. Are you going to slur everything or are you going to do more or less what the manuscript says with some measures slurred and some measures not? If you do decide to slur everything, I would recommend starting up bow just because then logically when you get to measure 10, you're on a down bow, which is where you want to be by measure 10. Same thing with measure 15, the start of the second section. If you start that up bow, then by the time you get to 34, you arrive on a down bow. Um, and starting up bow works perfectly well. It's not uncomfortable. Um, now, of course, you may want to consider doing Bach's original bowings. It's kind of interesting to think that some measures are slurred and some measures aren't. Now, it is a bit mystifying in a way. I have yet to be able to totally figure out a logical reason or pattern for why some measures are or are not slurred. I mean, you could think that, okay, he has the first two measures slurred and then doesn't continue writing in the slurs for every single measure because it's an implied simile. But if it's an implied simile, why does he have slurs in measure five? Well, you could argue maybe he put slurs in that measure because it doesn't have a dotted rhythm and he wanted to tell you, yes, even eighths also are slurred. Okay, fine, but then why does he not slur measure six? But then he does slur measure seven, which is even eighths, and then he slurs measure eight, which is a dotted rhythm. I mean, no argument you can come up with stands up, but then I, can't, I also can't figure out, okay, if he really did mean to have certain measures slurred and certain measures not slurred, why are three and four ones that are not slurred? Why six? What's special about six? I don't get it. So I finally decided, you know what? It doesn't matter if I get it or not. Bach was building in some variety. And you know what? If you're going along and you make a mistake, if you forget which measure is supposed to be slurred or not slurred, and you do a slur when there should have been a separate or a separate when there should have been a slurred, you know what? That's fine, as long as you have the variety. And I think that's what Bach was trying to do, is give you some variety. And it's, frankly, it's just more interesting. And I don't think it's more interesting because I'm not used to it. Now when I hear everything all slurred, okay, it's totally gorgeous. It's still totally gorgeous. Um, and I still love it. And I used to play it that way myself for years and years and years. But doing the slurs separate, slurs separate, it just kind of keeps you on your toes. And it's um, just a, a fun way to go about it. Um, you know, there's a whole long section where he has no slurs. You know, he has them for seven bars starting in 15, two bars not, one more bar with, and then a whole bunch of bars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, without. So seven plus two plus one plus eight. Again, I don't get it, but um, let's try it. So here you would start down bow. should we do but we what we should not do is backwards bowing there are lots and lots of places where backwards bowing works perfectly fine and has advantages um, in the grand scheme of things but this is not a, one of those rhythmic patterns where you can get away with it so 
just make a hook. <laughs> Does the fact that you have to make a hook there mean that clearly Bach couldn't have meant to have this kind of inconsistency because doing the bowings as written simply don't work? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think he was as stringent about you should do exactly the print as people these days are superimposing upon him. It would have been like, just do another up, but keep them sounding separate. <laughs> start to see a kind of a logic here because now after the slurs with the dot with the even eighths separates with the dotted rhythm slurs with the even eighths now we have the dotted rhythm I expect it to be separate again but no it's slurred so it's almost like he's doing what you don't expect <laughs> to slur, that is the question, or something like, you could really go either way. If you d simply don't like the separate bow feel, it's not a crime to add a slur. I think I'm actually a little fast. What's a good tempo? Not overly slow. It shouldn't be in six, but... Something like that. Okay, well, I'll keep playing it a little too fast just so we can work our way through it. Okay, so then we are here on measure 15, etc., etc., etc. Please, please, please do not roll your chord downwards. I know I talked about this already in the overview episode, but this is a prime culprit in measure 18 where people will do this ugly thing. That's like saying um, Hanyo instead of Johan. Um, it just wasn't done. Now, people like Izai and Bartok wrote those kind of backwards chords into their, um, their 20th century compositions actually as influenced by people playing Baroque music with backwards chords. Um, but that doesn't mean you should play these chords like they're Bach, um, Bartok or Isai. Um, it's just inside out and doesn't sound good. And if you want to hear my whole rant about it, you can listen to the overview episode. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, now here we are, and what are we going to do about this missing slur? Oh my gosh. So now we have, instead of a whole bar that's either slurred or not slurred, we have one beat only without a slur. It does solve the problem of measure 22, which you now come out nicely down bow. But I, I'm just not feeling it. Though actually, interestingly, it's bothering me less today than I remember it bothering me. And it does work, because if you start measure 15 down bow, by 20 you are up bow. Then here's a down up. Hmm, maybe I will try it that way next time I perform this movement. But if you choose to just put in the, the slur, if you feel like it's missing, um, then of course you do come out up bow in 22 and have to add a double up. <laughs> then a slur. And here I would use a 4-4 four, four across that chord. And you could. Either way, for some reason, because it's just a flick of it, I like that four string feel there. Double up in 25. Um, make sure in 28 that you don't think that that rest is a rest in the music. All it's doing is showing you that the middle voice is resting. So you've got the middle voice, which starts in beat one of measure 28 with an A, and then it doesn't have a note on the start of beat two, and then it comes back in at the 16th of beat two. Right, so it goes. 
but that doesn't mean that the music itself stops because the other two voices keep going. So people who, this is some big moment. I mean, after all, look at measure 29 and the quarter note rest. That doesn't mean you're somehow resting there. It's just a polyphonic thing. So connect 28 just as much as you otherwise would. And there's that wonderful moving line right there. Um, then we also have to make sure um, about, uh, let's see, the oh yes, measure 34, where we have these long slurs. So I would actually hook there. I mean, you could take a down bow. But that's not the tempo. It's, you know, that's just too icky. So those are some of the bowing things to figure out as you go along, and there's really no easy answers. Um, oh, 38 is also, if you play it as it comes, I think that works. That does indeed work, and actually the downs and ups make sense for the hemiola, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, so I would just do it totally as it comes, 38, 39. Then we've got 43. And maybe a new down. So you can be down. And this is nice to do in one slur because essentially that's like a written out of Pagiaturus. You don't want to make it like two separate notes. All right. So those are the bowings that we need to figure out and um, you can experiment with them now and then every few years kind of revisit your decisions and see if you still feel the same way. Don't assume that what you like today is what you're going to like um, tomorrow or next year. So the rhythm that we're working on, whether we do it slurred or separate or a mixture, um, rhythm is not exactly square, but it's not exactly over dotted either, just something that's comfortable. So not da, 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 one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You don't have to get hung up on that or making it overly peppy with, an, with too much of a double dot. You know, that would also be jarring. Um, but just something relaxed. But whatever you do, make sure that you are thinking of the inner beat, not to make it in six, but to make sure that you've, you're subdividing during these long dotted eighths just to make sure that you're staying steady. So just think of them as ands. One and a two and a three and a... Yeah, so just keep those inner beats going all the way through. Um, let's see, well, there's a rhythmic thing in measure 39 where Bach actually has an incorrectly notated beat. That's the second beat with a dotted eighth followed by three 30 seconds. So that adds up to one 30 second too much of music for that beat. So there are two possible solutions, maybe more. Um, one is that it truly is a dotted eighth and that the 30 seconds are actually meant to be a triplet. The other is that maybe the dotted eighth isn't quite a dotted eighth, but should really only be an eighth tied to one 30 second, followed by three more 30 seconds. And I've seen Urtext editions where they actually have the temerity to fix that beat um, and other similar ones in other movements to make them mathematically work. But you know, by calling themselves an Urtext and then not allowing you to cleanly see what Bach wrote and make your own decisions is just a little bit false advertising as far as I'm concerned. So dotted eighth, three thirty seconds, make your own decision. Maybe don't even count it out precisely, but just kind of, you know, squeeze the notes in there. They're a little ornament anyway. So you don't have to 
to go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. You don't have to make it so square. You also don't have to make it an exact triplet. Just kind of put them in there. And then we have a wonderful surprise chord, measure 40. We expect to have a resolution right there at the end of 39. But then instead we have that chord which comes out of left field, totally unexpected. And so really set it up for the audience and show it to them. Okay, and make sure that you hold the lower voice, maybe just a little longer, I mean the middle voice, so that you can come out of, but then no backwards chord, please. Because again, you're going han yo instead of Johan, and I don't think Bach would be pleased. So just play the chord and then connect. And then you can hold the top voice a little longer. Coming out of it. Um, one other thing to uh, think about is the s interesting measure 20, which has um, your finger barred in fifths across three strings, which on our instrument we actually wouldn't do. You know, you know we're not going to play the guitar and turn our finger inside out and actually bar three strings. Like we just don't do that in violin. So this actually was a Galamian fingering idea. See, I, I do still respect so much about his edition, even if my interpretation is wildly disparate from what he used to do back then. Um, so the fingering that he proposes is sh actually a shift. It's not that you're on your three and squeezing in your two or on your two and scrunching down your three. It's actually a shift. Now he does a, li a little differently than I've come up with over the years. He starts the downbeat of 20 in the second position, shifting back to first, then in first, shifting up to second, second, shifting down to first. For some reason, I, maybe it's because I do the last note of 19 on the E string, because I feel like, because the melody line wants to be on the E string, so I don't, you know, sort of, you know, do something that's not as good for the melody line just for the sake of my fingering. I don't go up to a four. So therefore, the fact that I'm on a low one here, I'm more comfortable setting down my threes in first position here, then I shift up to second, shift, second shifting down to first, first shifting me up to second, and just a little extension to get back to first on my first finger. So that's the secret behind that seemingly odd fingering in both Galamians and my additions in measure 20. The last thing I wanna mention is hemiolas. So a hemiola is where you take two three bars, two bars that are in three, two small threes, and you make them into one big three. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, you go one and two and three and. And there are five places where this happens in this movement. Um, they're all cadential. Um, the first one is measure 10. So, I mean, the tempo is so slow and it's all so spread out that you can hardly notice the difference in 10, but it does impact what your emphases are in 11 because the downbeat of 11 is now not a beat, it's the and of the previous beat two of the big three. One and two and three and and so therefore downbeat is less and then this what would be the original second beat which is now your last big beat three is more in measure eleven then you have another even more obvious one thirteen fourteen one. Measure 38. One. Oh, sorry. One. And then see here, you're on a down bow for two. And this up bow doesn't matter because it's just an and that you're tucking in before going to three. And then measure 43. 
So we have some interesting cadential things. Of course, um, you think that it's going to reach the G minor cadence at 12, but then there's actually a little interlude and then a second cadence, and then finally you do get there at 15, which is why we have those two hemiolas in a row. Here, of course, we have the hemiola at 38 leading to the surprise chord at 40 in those three bars, and then another cadence that, in fact, does finish you off. So in both cases, he delays the resolution just a little bit. And then 45 is the real end of the movement. In fact, if you were to ever perform this movement as a standalone, I would highly recommend, in fact, I think it's your only solution, is to end at 45 because that's where it resolves into C major and the movement finishes. The rest is a connector, um, a little interlude that gets you from the, the first movement to the second movement, but it's not really part of the first movement still, if you know what I mean. And you certainly want, want to end a movement on a five chord because that's no ending at all. And then you'd leave your audience hanging and that would be like somehow they would have that uncomfortable feeling even if they couldn't identify why they had it. Um, so either you got to write some more measures of your own and eventually come back to a tonic or just end at 45. So then we have a big hemiola right here in this little interlude. One. the big bass notes. So that one is super obvious. And if you want to add a little. To the next chord and then leave it hanging in the air. Don't finish the movement and then start the next movement. But magic and then. Okay, so those are some of my thoughts about the C major adagio. I'm Rachel Barton-Pine, and thank you for watching RBP on JSB.